you about the role of exercise in, in cancer, whether you are a currently going through treatments or after treatments and what you can do to safely exercise and the benefits of it. So today we're gonna review your possible side effects from cancer treatments and how it can impact your life, discuss the positive benefits of exercise, provide recommended guidelines for physical activity, examine the effects of exercise on specific cancers, and present examples to integrate into your activity. We're gonna use exercise and physical activity interchangeably. They're kind of one and the same. So you don't wanna feel like you have to make time to exercise and take classes and go to a gym. It can be any type of physical activity interchanged with exercise. A study showed among 800 breast cancer survivors that their overall activity levels decreased by two hours after diagnosis, which is a significant amount. And approximately only 20 to 30% of cancer survivors are meeting the public health exercise guidelines after treatment. These guidelines were set to um, maximize your health benefit. And so we are really looking to get people to get more active. Um, the American College of Sports Medicine has done numerous studies looking at exercise and the role of cancer prevention and treatment, specifically amongst these seven exercise, uh, cancers that are listed here on the side, including breast, endometrial, kidney, bladder, esophageal, stomach, and colon cancer. What you can actually do is you can extend this not only for cancer prevention and during treatment, but also for cancer uh, recurrence prevention. Um, all seven of these cancers have been shown to have a decreased recurrence when you integrate exercise into your regimen. So let's talk about some various cancer treatments. As a cancer survivor, you might have gone through any of these treatments or might have known someone that's gone through these treatments. And we're going to touch a couple of them today to see um, what the effects can be on your body and how exercise can help. First one we'll talk about is surgery. There's many different types of surgery out there, including instrumental cryosurgery, where it's kind of with freeze things, laser surgery or microscopically controlled surgery, where it's very, very tiny regions. The more invasive the surgery, the more effects it's gonna have on your body, such as an instrumental surgery for breast cancer with mastectomies, you're involving the chest, which can limit your shoulder mobility or even some of your back mobility or during ovarian cancer, if you have any abdominal surgery, that's gonna um, interfere with the muscle function because they have to go through that abdominal wall. So that's gonna limit your mobility and possibly your strength. Many cancer patients undergo chemotherapy, which is a systemic treatment that affects all cells in the body. Chemotherapy has a greater effect on rapid dividing cells. And the faster they divide, the bigger effect they have. And that's why chemotherapy targets cancer cells because cancer cells typically divide really fast. And so then the chemotherapy goes and it attacks those guys first, but unfortunately can't just selectively get those cancer cells. They do affect all other cells, such as cells that divide rapidly in your hair, in your nails, or in your skin and each chemotherapy has a different effect. They act very differently. Some will directly damage the DNA. Some will kind of separate out um, components of the DNA so that the cells can't continue to, to divide. And some may target blood vessels that supply the tumor. But those blood vessels don't just supply the tumor, they supply everything else. So it'll have a bigger effect on everything else also. Next, we have radiation therapy, where high energy particles damage cancer cells. This can be through an external beam or it can be in an implant also. Um, what they do is they damage the DNA within the cancer cells, either by a direct effect by creating free radicals that can damage the DNA. And some studies have shown that radiation can stimulate a cytokine or inflammatory reaction, which may contribute to fatigue that can last two to three months after, act, uh, after treatment. Inflammatory conditions also decrease protein synthesis and induces muscle fiber breakdown. So you can actually see the muscles kind of getting weaker around the areas of radiation. These cytokine um, molecules are signals and they signal your body to trigger inflammation, alter your blood cell generation. It might inhibit your metabolism, decrease your muscle function. Um, sometimes it can create hypothyroid conditions causing fatigue um, and can also affect your sleep-wake cycle. 
So even though we think of radiation as being very localized, say the breast, it'll still have a whole effect on the entire body because of these inflammatory processes that happen. So let's talk about some of the side effects and how exercise can help. The biggest thing I hear from my patients is that they're tired, they're fatigued. It's the sense of just being tired or exhausted that's related to your cancer treatment. It's not just, hey, I got a bad night of sleep. It's just, it's hard to kind of get through the day because I feel so tired. 70 to 100% of patients complain of fatigue in different studies. And these can last for months to years after you finish treatment. Fatigue may be due to anemia, chronic inflammation, depression, altered metabolism, impaired nutrition, or effects of the medication on your nervous system. So what can you do about it? It sounds very counterintuitive, but when you're fatigued, you should exercise. And everyone's saying, no, I should go to bed. But really, you should try to exercise. Because during cancer-related fatigue, you have a decreased delivery of oxygen cells which limits the amount of energy that can be created within those cells. And this causes the heart and the lungs to have to work harder. Your heart's gonna pump that oxygen around. And if you're not getting a lot of oxygen because of the cancer related treatments, then your heart has to work harder to get that oxygen to your muscles. Exercise increases the delivery of oxygen to the cells and allows for more conversion into energy. This also increases your red blood cells to the tissue, which can further decrease anemia. And exercise is also thought to decrease fatigue by decreasing the neurotoxicity from treatments and decreasing the chronic stress that affects the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which is just a fancy term for a part in your brain that releases your cortisol hormones, your stress hormones. So exercise can help regulate that to decrease the stress hormones in your body and can decrease um, the energy that your body has to expend in order to do things. Um, by decreasing the neurotoxicity from the treatments, it kind of helps get things moving. And so sometimes some doctors will recommend you getting on a physical activity regimen while you're going through treatments to kind of help mitigate some of the effects of chemotherapy. Another side effect uh, due to cancer treatments can be pain. And pain can be also known as arthralgia, which is just this kind of joint pain. It's very diffuse, um, not not usually very sharp, but just kind of achy always there. It can be due to surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, and aromatase inhibitors in breast cancer survivors. There's two different types of pain. There's nociceptive pain, which is usually having to do with the skin or the muscles, maybe some of the joints, or neuropathic pain, which is damage to the nerves. So exercise can help with your pain. It can alter the central processing of pain. So when you experience pain, so say I hit my elbow, I have little nerve receptors that are in my elbow that send a signal up to my brain for my brain to interpret where it got hurt and then send a signal back to be like, oh, remove your arm from that hot stove. So exercise can help the processing in your brain to kind of slow it down, to kind of say, hey, this doesn't hurt quite so much. Now you, you would still hurt your elbow if you bumped it but these kind of chronic pains that are in our joints or in our muscles due to cancer treatments, your brain can kind of ignore it a little bit and you can get on with your day. Some studies have shown that combined training, which includes aerobic and resistance exercise that Carol's gonna talk about later, has decreased pain in, in breast cancer survivors. And that aerobic and resistance exercise has also shown to decrease some symptoms of chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. We think this has to do with that increased oxygen being delivered um, to the nerves through the blood vessels. And so that can help some of those nerves recover from the damage that chemotherapy has done in those nerve endings. Next, we have sleep disturbance. So many cancer survivors complain of ha having difficulty falling asleep or they wake up too early or they can't stay asleep. Or even if they do sleep for eight hours, they don't feel like it's ever enough. This has been reported in about 30% of patients, and some patients have ended up using medication to help improve their sleep. But you're in luck because exercise can help improve your sleep. A study in 2015 showed that moderate intensity walking exercise significantly improves sleep in cancer patients. The exercise regime that they used was 40 minutes of walking three times a week. 
So it didn't have to be every day, but what it did is help kind of reset their sleep wake cycle. Um, and that will help improve your overall quality of sleep and the total sleep time so you can sleep longer throughout the night after starting that exercise program. Some other studies show that exercise can lead to an increase in blood flow to the skin and a rise in body temperature that promotes sleep. If you think about it, if you're taking a nice warm hot bath, you kind of get a little sleepy, you get that nice warm feeling, it, your body temperature is increased. That's kind of what uh, exercise does too. So, but you don't necessarily have to exercise right before bed. It can increase your body temperature for a few hours so that you can sleep more restfully through the night. Another big thing we see with cancer patients after their treatments is cardiovascular changes. So this can occur due to chemotherapy or stem cell transplantation. So in stem cell transplant recipients, they have found to have a five times increased risk of cardiovascular disease, which can include coronary artery disease and heart failure. So it's very important for us to address heart issues after cancer treatments. People um, have also shown structural changes in their heart. They've had decreased stroke volume, which is the amount of blood that's pumped out of your heart with each beat, an increased resting heart rate, a decreased ventricle mass, which is a chamber in your heart that helps pump the blood, um, and increased artery wall thickening. Sometimes we'll also see altered levels of red blood cells and platelets after cancer treatments. So how can exercise help your heart? So when you start exercising, your heart automatically starts changing. It increases its cardiac output, which is the total amount of blood that gets pumped through your body. It increases stroke volume, which is the amount of blood that's pumped with each beat of the heart. And it obviously increases your heart rate because you're working harder. And that's good because you're challenging the heart, which will make it more efficient. As you continue with your exercise training, you see an increase in your red blood cells, your hematocrit and your hemoglobin, which can help with symptoms of anemia. An aerobic exercise can increase the heart's ability to pump blood per contraction, even at rest. So when you're exercising, your heart is working harder and you're pumping more, but those effects last when you're not exercising and makes your heart overall more efficient. So it doesn't have to work as hard when you're resting, which also will help your fatigue levels. Uh, we've seen increases in those, that cardiac output and stroke volumes, so the amount of blood pumping through your heart with moderate exercise. So you don't have to go too heavy to see these changes, but something that kind of gets your heart working a little bit harder. And Carol's gonna give us more um, ideas of what we can do for moderate exercise. Another big change that we see after cancer treatments is a suppressed immune system. And right now we're all working on making sure that our immunity is as strong as can be because of everything that's going on. After treatments, we can see a lower number of white blood cells, and then we can also see just a decreased effectiveness of the immune cells themselves. So there might not be as many, and they're not fighting as strong as they could be. So let's exercise. After exercise, we can see an increase in specific immune cells. So we have these natural killer cells, which help regulate cancer cells, monocytes and granulocytes, which are white blood cells, and they kind of help prevent infections. We've also seen a decrease in the duration of neutropenia uh, with exercise. And a study involving breast cancer survivors showed an increase in immune cells following a 15 week aerobic exercise routine. So not very long. And you can already see the increase in immunity. What we see in this graph over here is a relationship between the intensity of exercise and the risk of infection. So first we start off with sedentary. So that's not moving around, we're not doing enough. So we have an average risk of infection. If we go to moderate uh, intensity exercise, our risk of infection actually decreases, which is great because our immune cells are building up, they're becoming more efficient. But then if we continue to push to really high intensity exercise, our infection risk actually goes up because we're pushing our body too much. And we need to listen to our body to make sure that we're giving it just the right amount of exercise to boost our system without overtaxing it. Another change that we see after cancer treatments are musculoskeletal change. So these are changes in your muscle and your bones. We tend to see a decrease in lean body mass. So sometimes those muscles kind of get a little bit weaker and smaller. 
or we'll see an increase in fat mass and we can see weight gain. Some of that has to do with the medications, especially if you're taking steroids, it can make you kind of gain some weight. And sometimes we'll see some bone density changes. This is fairly common in breast cancer survivors, um, especially with the hormonal therapy, it can induce some osteoporosis. So exercise can help. <laughs> exercise has been shown to have really great benefits on bone. There's a, a law called Wolf's Law, which says that wherever bone is stressed or used, you're gonna lay down more bone and reinforce it. And that's how exercise works. We start to load the bone a little bit more and the bone um, builds its structure a little bit stronger. So some studies have shown that weight-bearing exercise have significant effects on both the femur, the thigh bone, and your spine uh, in terms of their density. It can kind of slow down the rate of osteoporosis and osteopenia. Randomized control trials show that moderate intensity exercise lessen bone loss in breast cancer survivors, and follow-up trials show an increased bone mineral density in groups that did resistance training in addition to taking the medications that they were prescribed by their doctors. Exercise also improves your muscle. It makes you stronger. So we see an increase in muscle mass and the muscle's ability to generate force. So not only are they bigger muscles, but they're stronger muscles. We can see an increase in tissue pliability or flexibility by the change in the collagen fibers that are in the muscle and the tendons. And one study, not once, several studies um, have shown that adults that have greater hand grip strength have a 31% reduced all-cause mortality risk. This is not just with cancer, this is just in general, healthy older adults. And while um, hand grip strength is a good indication, but also quadricep strength, so the muscle that's on the front of your thigh has shown a 14% lower risk of death. So the feeling is that if you're stronger, you're gonna tend to live longer. So let's recap some benefits of exercise. We have our aerobic fitness, so it helps improve our heart health and efficiency of our heart to pump blood through our body. We see an increase in muscle strength, increase in flexibility, can see improvement in body composition, so improving that lean muscle mass, decreasing our fat mass, improve overall our quality of life. It can increase our immune response, can decrease pain, improve sleep, cognitive function. So that's a whole new um, realm that's being really studied. And it is shown that exercise can actually help you think better. Um, it can offset some of the early onsets of Alzheimer's. Um, and it's this up and coming area of, of research that is showing just how great exercise is for your cognitive function. And can also improve your treatment tolerance. This is being currently studied um, in multiple groups of uh, patients undergoing physical activity during their cancer treatments and being able to tolerate the medications a little bit better. So that's a lot of benefits of exercise, of one thing. I don't know a single medication that can improve all those things, but it's great because exercise is easily attainable for everybody um, and you can tailor it to your own needs. We do have a couple precautions before you start exercising. One is to avoid inactivity. We don't wanna sit, we wanna get moving. Somebody in motion is gonna stay in motion. You wanna consider your prior exercise history. If you've never ran a marathon, don't start off by running a marathon. Let's start with walking. We wanna allow for appropriate healing after surgery. We don't wanna tax our body too much. We don't wanna exercise with extreme fatigue or anemia. That's when you can kind of increase your risk of injury. You wanna consider your immune function. This is more applicable to kind of pre-COVID times in terms of using a gym or community equipment, um, making sure you're wiping things down um, because there's a lot of germs out there as we all know now. And of course, you always wanna consult your physician prior to starting an exercise program. So now Carol is gonna take over and talk about the guidelines that are being put out there for cancer survivors and how you can incorporate it into your activity. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about um, the exercise guidelines. Um, um, so according to the um, American College of Sports Medicine, and also Diana had mentioned before, that the um, exercise can help to prevent seven common types of cancers and also improve your survival rate and decrease recurrence 
rate of breast, colon, and prostate cancer. So the ACSM exercise guideline indicates um, at least 30 minutes of moderate intense aerobic exercise about three to five days a week or vigorous intense aerobic exercise for 20 minutes, uh, three days a week. Um, it's, it's, and it's also important to include um, like a, a strengthening program with your exercises, um, maybe about eight to 10 um, strength, different types of strength training exercises. And you wanna do about eight to 12 reps, um, two to three sets, and you can incorporate that in about two, uh, about twice a week. So the next um, I wanna discuss, um, um, so what is the different types of intensity levels? So the moderate intensity is described as working hard enough to increase your heart rate and work up a sweat, but you can still carry on a conversation. And your target heart rate should be around uh, 50 to 70% of your maximum heart rate. Vigorous exercise is um, more intense workout uh, where you can't carry on a, where you shouldn't be able to carry on a conversation. And your heart, target heart rate should be around 70 to 85% of your maximum heart rate. So how do we figure out our um, heart rate, target heart rate when we're working out? So there's many ways you can track your heart rate. Um, a lot of people right now have Fitbits or Apple Watch, and that can be, they easily track your heart rate um, when you're exercising. But if you don't have any of those things, you can just manually um, monitor your heart rate by um, taking your pulse. So you wanna take your pulse on the inside of your wrist on the thumb side, and you wanna take your index and middle finger. You don't um, wanna use your thumb because your thumb has a pulse of its own, so it might get confusing. And you wanna just place it over your wrist, and then you count the beats for 30 seconds. Um, and then you can multiply that by two to get your heart rate. Uh, you can also, it might be some, for some people, it might be difficult to get your pulse from your wrist. So you can also check on your neck, on your carotid artery. So that might be stronger and easier to um, feel. So for example, um, you can, um, so if, um, and then you can uh, calculate your um, max heart rate is 20, 220, um, 220 minus your age. So for example, if you're 50 years old, um, you, you go 220 minus 50 is 170. And then you, you can multiply it by uh, 50 to 70%. So your target heart rate should be 85 to 119 for moderate intensity exercise. And then my next slide shows the my next slide shows kind of the range target heart rate, uh, target heart, heart rate zones um, per age group. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and talk about different types of exercise modes. Um, so, so aerobic exercise um, helps to improve cardiovascular health, pulmonary health and improve endurance. Um, you can perform the same types of aerobic exercise, but you can do them at different intensity levels. So for example, you can do a leisurely bike, you know, on the uh, bike path at the beach uh, for a light intensity workout. But then you can kind of make it a moderate intensity workout by um, going up inclines and kind of doing an interval between flat and hilly paths. And then you can make it even more vigorous by um, pedaling faster, um, more than faster than 10 miles per hour. And then you can incorporate different um, inclines as well. 
or you can go mountain biking, which is uh, very vigorous. Um, so, and then there's other forms. If you're not a big exercise sports person, you can get aerobic workouts from other forms of physical activities. You can do gardening or cleaning your house, um, playing with your kids, um, as long as you can increase your heart rate for at least 10 minutes or more. Um, so for example, the other day I was swiffering uh, the floors and vacuuming and scrubbing the tub. And that took about 15 to 20 minutes. And then when I checked my heart rate it was about 110. So during that time, so that is 15 to 20 minutes of moderate intensity exercise without actually exercising. So um, there are, and if you're um, new to exercising, you don't have to try to do all 30 minutes of exercises at once. Um, you can break it down to 10 to 15 minute intervals of activity and spread it out throughout the day. Um, so then you can kind of slowly build your tolerance. Um, and you can do um, exercises. Um, and if you are saying you're too busy to exercise, you can kind of incorporate physical activity throughout your day by maybe using the stairs instead of the elevators, or you know, if you have an appointment to go to the doctors, um, you park your car a little further away so you can get in those steps. Um, and you can also, you know, if you need to do chores like gardening, uh, weed, weeding, raking the leaves, walking your dogs, all those are considered physical activity and they can become an aerobic exercise. Okay. So next I wanna go ahead and talk about strength training. So it's important to build your strength um, which can be achieved by using a resistance band, you can use weights, um, or just use your body weight. So um, strengthening can help to maintain healthy bones, muscles, and joints, and just improve overall performance of activities of daily living. Um, and you can still strengthen without equipment by using things around your house, um, like your water, like water bottles, canned food, a sack of flour. Um, you can use anything that provides a little bit of weight. Um, and so I have, you can use cans, you can use resistance bands. Because right now I know it's been hard to get um, exercise equipment since everybody's purchasing them. So you can just go ahead and use things around the house. Um, and I wanted to go ahead and um, demonstrate some of the exercises that you can do, perform without a lot of equipment. So, all right, let's see if you can see. So I wanna first go ahead and show you the sit to stand exercise it is good for building quad strength, glute strength, and it's very functional. I don't know if you can see. Okay. So you can find a chair to sit on. Make sure it's not going to move away from you. And you're basically, what you're going to do is you're going to Sit nice and tall, pull in your tummy, set your feet hip distance apart, okay? And then you're gonna go ahead and stand up and then sit back down slowly. And then you can go ahead and repeat that eight to 12 times, depending on how you feel, okay? And that is very functional exercises and a very important one since it helps to build your lower body strength. 
Okay. Um, all right. And then the next exercise I wanted to review with you is um, you can do push ups and you can change them up to make them easier or harder. So you can go ahead and do a wall push up. So, so you're going to go ahead and against the wall. So the further you are away from the wall, the harder it's going to be. So you can go ahead and stand close if this is your first time. Okay. And then your hands are going to be um, shoulder distance apart. And then you're going to just slowly push your body against the wall and then push away. Okay. So this is going to help build the strength in your upper arms, your biceps and the muscles between your shoulder blades, which help with your posture. So this is a great exercise. And also you can incorporate your core strength with this as well. So make sure you keep your tummy tight, nice and straight, your back is straight. And then you're gonna slowly bend your elbow and then push, it, push your body away. So, and if that's too easy for you, you can go ahead and change your incline. So you can go ahead and do it from maybe a table, uh, a countertop surface, and then you can even make it harder by doing it on the floor. You can start on your knees and then you can do, and then even up into a regular push-up. Okay. And then the next exercise I wanted to demonstrate is the bridge exercise, which is to help strengthen your backside. All right. I hope you can see this. So I have a table here. So you can lie on the mat. You can use a yoga mat. Um, you're going to go ahead and lie down on your back. So you're going to go ahead and pull your belly button in, tighten up your stomach. Okay. Your feet are set hip distance apart. Your knees are also in line like a railroad track. You're gonna place your hands by your side, tighten up your stomach, squeeze your butt, and then you're gonna go ahead and lift nice and smooth. So you're gonna hold it and then lower slowly. slowly. So we wanna make sure here at the top of your movement, you're squeezing your bottom, okay? and then keeping your stomach tight. So you want to make sure you're not arching your back like this because then you're going to get lower back pain. But this is going to help with strengthening your backside, your glutes, your hamstrings, and also your core. Okay. All right. Okay. And then the next exercise is We are going to do, with waste, I'm just going to use these cans of tomato. Um, you can use water bottles. Um, they even sell water bottles at the 99 cent store where it's specifically for waste. So they look like little dumbbells, but you can fill them up with water and, um, and they're a dollar. So, so the first one we're gonna do is an overhead press. So you're gonna hold your weight. You're gonna stand nice and tall, pull your stomach in, okay? So no arching of the back, okay? And then you're just gonna go ahead and then press up and bring down. Press up and bring down. So the important thing here is not to shrug your shoulders, okay? Keep your shoulder blades down. And then you're just gonna press up and down. Okay. And then just to what to watch for here is make sure when you're lifting up, you're not arching your back. You gotta pull your stomach in nice and tall. Okay. All right. And then quickly, the next exercise, bicep curls. Okay. You're gonna just pull your stomach in again. Okay. And then you're just gonna bend your elbows and then straighten them. 
and that's to build strength in your upper arm. Okay. And then I know we'll also, I'll show you triceps, which everybody wants to work out this part of their body. So you're going to go ahead. Same thing. Keep your tummy tight. Okay. Keep your back straight. Okay. Bend your knees a little bit. And then you're going to make sure your shoulders aren't hunched forward. They're back. And then you're going to go ahead and straighten your elbows. So if you straighten and squeeze, you get that squeeze of the tricep. Okay. All right. And then the next exercise we'll quickly go over is the bent over rows. So the rows is to help strengthen the muscles between your shoulder blades. Okay, which is good for posture. So you're gonna go ahead and stand nice and tall. You're gonna slightly bend your knees and your hips, keeping your stomach tight. And then you're gonna go ahead and pull your elbows back. So what to watch out for here is that you're not shrugging your shoulders. You pull your shoulder blades back and down, and then you're gonna go ahead and bring your elbows back. All right, and then lastly, um, I'm going to go ahead and show you a reverse fly. And this too targets your upper back. So same thing, you're going to slightly bend your knees, bring your hips back. My back is still straight. So I'm keeping my stomach tight, okay? And then I'm going to open and squeeze my shoulder blades together. In this too, you want to make sure that you're not scrunching your shoulders up when you lift. Okay, and then you're we're targeting the muscles between the shoulder blades. All right. So those are pretty quick and simple exercises that you can perform and without a lot of equipment. All right. Okay, so just some you know, precautions, um, always consult with your oncologist or your um, primary care physician um, before you start any new exercises, because there are some you know, conditions that can affect what exercises you can do. So, I mean, you have to be careful if you have you know, poor balance or unsteady walking, um, if you have severe anemia, if there's any sort of infection, um, poor bone health, um, like osteoporosis due to some of your, the cancer treatments. Um, and a lot of people get uh, peripheral neuropathy, which is the numbness and tingling in your limbs, um, which can decrease sensation um, and which can also affect your balance. So, and um, also making sure you um, don't have uncontrolled heart or lung disease, because those, those can impact what kind of exercises you can perform. Okay, and then just a little, um, so um, you don't have to, if you're new at exercising, you can slowly build up your tolerance for 30 minutes of aerobic exercise. So you don't have to do everything all at once. You can space them out 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, uh, and then slowly build your tolerance to doing 30 minutes of exercise. Okay. Um, you know, things, if you're feeling pain when you're doing any of these exercises, just stop um, because you don't want to go, you don't want to injure yourself. Um, muscle soreness, you can develop muscle soreness, which is different from pain, and that's okay. And muscle soreness can develop 24 to 36 hours after you do your exercise, but you shouldn't be so sore that you can't do your normal activities. Um, 
Also just watching out for if you become lightheaded or dizzy or difficulty breathing, do not continue and do not push, uh, push through. Just go ahead and stop your exercise and consult with a physician. Um, if you, um, and also make sure you're staying hydrated. Um, so basically the, the take home message is avoid inactivity. Um, it's important, that's like the worst thing you can do. So make sure you incorporate some sort of physical activity every day. And if you're unsure where to start, go ahead and consult with a physical therapist and they can help to put a program together for you. So if you have any questions, go ahead. This is our contact. Um, I'm carol.kishi at providence.org and diana.garrett at providence.org. And it looks like we have a few questions. Um, so the first question is about what you just talked about, about if you can break up the 30 minutes a day into smaller bits of time, um, or do you have to do the 30 minutes total? So like Carol said, you can definitely start out with doing it in increments and intervals. Um, that's usually very helpful if you're starting out on an exercise program, or if you're just kind of strapped on time, you want to get little bits here and there. Ideally, it'd be great to get 30 minutes of continuous physical activity eventually. So we can really see those benefits of your heart and in your immune cells. Um, but anywhere, start off where you can and kind of build up to that. Um, let's see. We have another question of putting the heart rate back chart back up. So let me go see if I can find that. There it is. Um, so like Carol said, these are just some great target areas. They're not um, absolutes, you know, if you feel like your heart is, you know, if you're 50 years old and your heart rate's at 147, it's okay. Take some deep breaths. It'll come back down. They're not hard stops there. They're just kind of guidelines for how hard should you push yourself. And I think Carol brought up a great example of with that moderate intensity exercise, you should still be able to talk. You're feeling your heart rate work. Maybe you're sweating a little bit but you're still able to make full sentences. So that's great if you can go out for a walk with someone wearing your masks, which makes exercise even harder. Um, <laughs> but then you can have a buddy to talk to and can kind of check in with each other. How are you feeling? If your friend is having a hard time making their sentences, maybe you're walking too fast, or maybe you need to take not take the hill because that's going to make you work harder. Um, but it's always great to have somebody to exercise with. They hold you accountable, but they can also watch out for you if they think that you're pushing yourself a little too much. Let's see any. If you have any questions in terms of specifically for yourself, um, we can try to answer them through emails. A lot of times it's hard for us to answer things through because we want to evaluate you first to see where you're at, see what your strength, your balance is before making any specific recommendations. Um, so that's when you can go see a physical therapist, which is covered by insurance. Um, so usually at no cost to you um, to have your own set, like personal trainer in a very safe environment um, who can watch and monitor all of your symptoms. I know personally, I've I'm seeing a couple of people right now through, we do telehealth also, um, and kind of guiding through exercise. Uh, she came to me with um, complaints of arthralgia due to the aromatase inhibitors after breast cancer. And just getting her started on a little exercise program, she's doing about 20 to 30 minutes a day. Um, and after two weeks of starting exercise, she's already saying that her pain is decreasing. Um, and she just, she looks taller, she looks stronger, she's doing really great. All right. Well, I think that's it for us. Again, if you have any questions or you want to um, follow up with anything, our emails are at the end. Um, let me see if I can pop them back up just in case anybody is missing them. My name is Diana Garrett. My lovely partner in crime, Carol Gishi. We're both here um, at Providence um, at Performance Therapy and really hoping that you guys feel the, um, the encouragement to get out there and, and move. It's the best medication for your body that has little to no side effects. <laughs> <laughs>